There are three rules for testifying at trial. Number one, always say your honor or sir when talking to the judge. Number two, say yes or no, not yeah or mm-hmm or uh-uh. And number three, always wait until the lawyer is done asking a question before you answer. I smiled at TJ as he sat in the witness stand next to the judge, his legs too short for his feet to touch the floor. I had tried to prepare the 12 year old for this moment. Remember, the prosecutor's not on our side. He's going to try to make you mad. He's trying to convince the judge to convict you. But it was all up to TJ now. The judge turned to the assistant state attorney. Cross-examination counselor? TJ was on trial for a violent felony. The victim was a public school teacher, a young white woman who had been assigned to a school for middle schoolers with emotional disabilities. TJ was a student in her sixth period class. One day, the teacher ta caught TJ with his cell phone out in the classroom. She took it away and put it in her desk drawer over TJ's protests. A few minutes later, someone from the main office came for TJ. He needed to take a hearing test. I need my cell phone back, he told the teacher. No, the young woman explained. You'll just be gone for a few minutes. You'll get it after class. Less than 15 minutes later, TJ was in custody on his way to juvenile detention, charged with battery on a teacher. By the time I met TJ, I had been a public defender for about a year, and I was filled with the self-righteous arrogance of a 25-year-old who chose not to make a lot of money and chose to live in Florida under Governor Jeb Bush among people who had just re-elected President George W. Bush and who chose not to be a real lawyer but to be a public pretender instead. <laughs> My online dating screen name was based on To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> I religiously watched The Wire at the apartment of friends who could actually afford HBO. And I mocked the preppy white boys who came down to Florida from fancy Northeastern law schools so they could put black and brown people in prison. Not like me, oh no. I was a nerdy white girl who came down to Florida from a fancy Northeastern law school to try to keep black and brown people out of prison. I was one of the good guys. During, <laughs> during my first week at my fancy law school, a professor said in the middle of class, if you came to law school to change the world, you're in the wrong place. Go to film school. <laughs> I scoffed. That winter, I took an unpaid internship interviewing inmates at Rikers Island who had been beaten by guards. As I would ride the subway to the end of the line in Queens to the bus that only carries people visiting folks on the inside, I thought to myself, what does Professor Kramer know anyway? When I arrived at the jail one day, I learned that a total of 12 inmates and guards had been sent to the hospital as the first day of the New York State ban on cigarettes was enforced. The commissary had sold its last packs to inmates the day before, and they were not giving them up without a fight. I turned around and got back on the bus to the train back to Manhattan. Public defenders all have stories about being asked the question. Some variation of, how can you defend those people? Or, have you ever defended a person that you knew was guilty? <laughs> My quick and easy answer is that no person should live at a place like Rikers Island, no matter what they've done. I talk about the train and the bus and the cigarettes and the violent guards. I don't tell them that I realized exactly who I was. On the day that I visited a Rikers Island inmate who had been beaten by guards the day before, but who would not or could not say a single word to me. When I finally got up to leave, he finally spoke, saying, please stay, as he looked at me and began masturbating. <laughs> I slowly opened the door behind me, glancing in the direction of guards, the words, no, 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 please, stop, no, barely escaping me as I left him in the visiting room. I didn't want him to get caught. 
In the case of the people of the state of Florida versus TJ, age 12, the charge was battery on a teacher, a violent felony. After TJ's teacher told him that he couldn't have a cell phone until the end of class, TJ panicked. He had to take a city bus home after school, and the bus left five minutes after the bell rang. And if he missed the bus, he would be in big trouble at home. TJ would never tell me exactly what big trouble meant. Nobody from home ever came to court. But he was not leaving that classroom without his cell phone, so he made a beeline for the teacher's desk. Seeing where he was headed, the teacher stepped into TJ's path, but he kept running. He ran right into the teacher, knocking her back a couple of steps. He was opening the drawer to get the phone when the school security guards grabbed him. The teacher was already at another school by the time TJ's case went to trial. I explained our defense to TJ. We were trying to show that he wasn't trying to push the teacher, that she had stepped into his path, that it was an accident. I went to detention to visit TJ and for him to practice testifying. Cross-examination would be the hardest part. TJ should just try to answer with yes and no and, of course, should try not to get mad. He's going to try to show the judge what happens when you lose your temper, so the judge will think you pushed the teacher on purpose. TJ's case was assigned to the chief juvenile judge, a man who was shorter than many of the young boys he sentenced and who had the Napoleon complex to match King Lester. <laughs> we called him, in part because of the long lecturing proclamations he would give from the bench, especially when delivering a not guilty verdict. I told TJ that if the judge started talking about how he should listen to his teacher and not play with a cell phone in class, it was probably a sign that we were going to win. <laughs> TJ's trial was one of 10 that were set for the same day. The detained children sat on benches, in leg shackles, in a hallway behind the courtrooms, waiting for their cases to be called. The door to the hallway was guarded by a corrections officer, a slightly older black man from the same neighborhood where many of our clients lived. One day, when the prosecutor was new to the courtroom, that corrections officer asked if he had seen the holding area yet. It's pretty dark back there, he said, raising his eyebrows. The prosecutor didn't get it. During a year spent in juvenile court, I represented one white boy. He came to court in his ROTC uniform, and he was with his mother. He had been caught shoplifting at a store, and when the police took him to juvenile intake, they told his mother that he could take a class for first-time offenders and they would drop the case. His mother asked for a court date. She and the boy's father had divorced, and she thought that a stern talking to from a judge would do the boy some good. When the mother and the son arrived at court, they were told that the offer was a guilty plea in juvenile probation because the boy had refused to take the first offender class. By the end of the morning calendar, we had gotten him signed up for the class and convinced the judge to say some tough words. The boys who looked more like Trayvon Martin than Justin Bieber were not so lucky. One day, on my way to work, a man at a coffee shop saw the state-issued ID around my neck and asked if I was a public defender. When I said yes, he turned to his young son and said, this lady helps the bad guys when they get in trouble. I wanted to snap back at him. Tell me what you do for a living so I can moralize about your career. I ordered my bagel instead. <laughs> <laughs> and thought that there probably weren't any cops at this boy's school. Most of my clients were arrested at school. One boy was convicted of battery for throwing an orange during a cafeteria food fight. Another was beaten by school police after he refused to go to the principal's office for talking back to the teacher. And another client convinced a female friend to let him turn in the knife that she brought to defend against bullies. And then he was charged with weapon possession under the school's no tolerance policy. The evil prosecutors had convicted those other kids, but TJ still had a chance. We had prepared, and he had testified about what happened with the teacher and the cell phone and the hearing test and the big trouble. He had even remembered to say, Your Honor and Sir, so that he started the, each, the answer to each question by turning to face the judge and say, Your Honor, Sir, before giving his answer. He had done great. Now he just needed to survive the cross-examination. The prosecutor started by asking about the cell phone policy, 
TJ knew that he wasn't supposed to have a cell phone in class, didn't he? Yes, sir, Your Honor, sir. And yes, he knew that the teacher would take the phone away. And yes, he knew that he would get it back at the end of class. I had already asked him about all of this. The prosecutor started ramping up. You said you needed your cell phone back, didn't you? Yes, sir. The teacher told you that you couldn't have it back, didn't she? Yes, sir. But you really wanted it back, didn't you? Yes, sir. And when the teacher said you couldn't have it, that made you angry, didn't it? I struggled to think of an objection. But before I could get to my feet, TJ turned to the judge, looked him in the eyes, and said, Your Honor, sir, the whole reason they put me in that school in the first place is because I got a problem with anger. <laughs> King Lester stopped and looked over at TJ. And I knew the 12-year-old had just won his own trial. It was as if, for that moment, the judge realized the insanity of a system that would prosecute an emotionally disabled child for a criminal lack of impulse control. The judge's proclamation before the not guilty verdict was unusually brief. Every public defender has stories they tell to answer the question, how can you help the bad guys when they get in trouble? How can you defend guilty people? I tell people that I don't believe in bad guys. I explain that guilty just means that a person did what he was accused of doing, but doesn't tell us anything about why. Often, I tell people about TJ's case. The whole reason they put him in that school in the first place is because he had a problem with anger. Thank you. It's Lauren Cusatello. It was 4 a.m. when the printer spat out my essay. I reread it, second guessing my last line. Thus, Miller and Salinger, through Abigail and Holden, proved that.